Thanks very much, Janice. Okay, I'm conscious of time, so even though the, the screen hasn't swapped over yet, I might get started. Um, if people can hear me, uh, then it doesn't matter too much if my my picture is a little smaller, um, then uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll crack on. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for the invitation to come speak uh, this morning. Um, so, as Janice mentioned, my background is as a, a legal academic. I, I specialise in the areas of, of children's rights and child protection law in particular. Uh, and uh, through that, I've done quite a bit of work uh, around the issue of child abuse um, and looking at that both from the perspective of uh, the perspective of uh, protecting children from abuse uh, and from being abused in the first place, but also on meeting the needs of victims of abuse. Uh, and as part of that, uh, I came across a couple of years ago the work of an organization called the Courthouse Dogs Foundation, who are based in Seattle in the US. Uh, so I was at a conference in Brussels and Ellen uh, O'Neill Stevens and uh, Celeste Walton from the, the Courthouse Dogs, Dogs Foundation were at the same conference presenting their work uh, and they specialize in particular in working with victims of child sex abuse. And in the US, uh, whatever about the, the, the issues we, we are aware of in the systems on this side of the world where uh, there's a significant risk of secondary traumatization in trials like this, uh, in the US, if anything, it's even higher because uh, the position there is that the, the victims must testify in the courtroom. They don't have some of the measures that will be common in, 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 in this part of the world, like video link testimony and so on. Um, and so they had pioneered uh, the, the, this process of training dogs to a very particular standard. It's a kind of a, uh, an adaptation of animal assisted therapy that we're, we know from other contexts, uh, but training dogs especially to be partnered with the dog through or partnered with the child through the traumatic parts of the process, like police interview, for example, and in particular, uh, the process of court testimony. Uh, and they had seen some extremely strong results from this. And I was really taken by, by the presentation when I saw it. Uh, and through that, you know, opened a dialogue with the Courthouse Dogs Foundation and subsequently became part of a broader European group led by Victim Support Europe, who were interested in bringing this, this very innovative practice to Europe. It really hadn't uh, been used very much at all outside of North America at that point uh, and re had mostly been used with, with children. Um, and so that uh, series of meetings uh, subsequently became the FIDO project. And the FIDO project uh, was looking not just to bring facility dogs to Europe, but also to pilot their use with a broader range of victims of crime. Uh, so not just victims of child sexual abuse, uh, but also uh, victims of all the other categories of crime. So uh, the, the project has run over the past two years. It's been funded by the Rights Equality and Citizenship Programme of, of the European Union. Uh, Victim Support Europe were the umbrella organisation for, for the project. Uh, and then we had partners in uh, France, Italy and Belgium who were piloting the use of the dogs. And I'm going to talk more about that. Uh, and then uh, my, myself and, and University College Cork were involved as the research partner where we were gathering data on the effectiveness of, of this practice. Uh, so what I'm going to do for the next uh, 16 or 17 minutes is I'm going to share a little bit, first of all, about the international human rights law standards, which uh, we're at the heart of what we were doing. Um, you know, what does international human rights law say about uh, what we should do for victims of crime? And then going to say a little bit about the, the pre-existing research which was available to us before we started the project. You know, what, what did we know at that point uh, about the use of facility dogs with victims? Uh, and then I'm going to share some of the data that we collected over the last two years in, in these pilot projects across uh, the three countries. Uh, so, uh, to begin with, you know, coming at it from, from my perspective as a children's rights lawyer and, and looking at the fact that, that the Courthouse Dogs Foundation had worked primarily with children, you know, an obvious starting point would be the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. 
so this is is the, the most ratified uh, human rights convention in the world. It's been ratified uh, effectively uh, everywhere in the world apart from, from North America, uh, uh, or at least apart from the United States uh, of America. Uh, and there are a number of provisions in there, just to highlight one or two of the main ones, which, which uh, impose obligations on parties to the convention to, to meet the needs of child victims. So under Article 39 of the convention, uh, there's an obligation uh, to uh, provide appropriate measures to promote the physical and psychological recovery of a child victim. Um, and that's been expanded on by the Committee on the Rights of the Child, particularly in General Comment Number 13, where they've talked about uh, the importance of ensuring the protection of child victims and child witnesses uh, and about adapting the whole uh, criminal justice process uh, so that you try to, as far as possible, uh, operate that in a, in a child friendly way. Uh, then at Council of Europe level, we've seen um, some uh, elaboration on that, particularly in the Lanzarote Convention of 2007, which is particularly focused on child sexual abuse. Article 14 of, of the convention similarly obliges states uh, to take measures to assist victims of child sexual abuse in their physical and psychosocial recovery. Uh, and states are obliged to take this protective approach towards victims uh, and ensuring as far as possible that investigations and criminal proceedings don't aggravate the trauma which has already been uh, experienced by the victims. Um, so this risk of secondary uh, victimization and secondary trauma uh, is really called out in the Lanzarote Convention and states are obliged to, to try to mitigate that risk as, as far as they can. Uh, and more recently then the Istanbul Convention which is particularly focused on uh, gender-based violence and domestic violence uh, imposes very similar obligations uh, around vulnerable per persons more broadly. So we're not here just looking at, at child victims, we're looking at, at all vulnerable persons. Um, there's this obligation to try to avoid secondary uh, victimization, to meet specific needs of vulnerable persons, um, and to provide specialist women's support services to women victims of violence and their children. Um, so these are just a selection of some of the international law measures that impose obligations. I, I, an earlier version of this presentation included also the EU Victims' Rights Directive. I, I've, I've omitted that for this morning, just conscious of obviously the impact of Brexit and, and the audience for today. Um, but there are other conventions as well. And essentially, there's a common theme in international human rights law, uh, you know, that's, that's increasingly prevalent that identifies that victims in general are at risk of secondary traumatization in the justice system. There are some categories of victims that are especially vulnerable to this risk, and therefore states are obliged to implement measures to mitigate that risk. What those laws are silent on, however, is what those measures, measures should look like. So it's a kind of an umbrella or headline obligation to put in place measures to mitigate that risk. But there's a wide discretion left to states as to what sort of measures they want to use to that effect. And so that then raises the question of where do facility dogs fit in to all of this? And, and so what did we already know about facility dogs before uh, we, we, we began to use them uh, in Europe? Well, first of all, we knew quite a lot about the benefits to people of uh, being in the presence of animals and, and of animal assisted therapy, broadly speaking. And there's lots and lots of evidence here from a range of disciplines. It's interesting that, that the evidence can be both what the victims say themselves, but in cases it can also be, be corroborated uh, through things like uh, physical tests such as heart rate, blood pressure, uh, testing cortisol levels through saliva samples and so on. And essentially there's a wealth of evidence that simply being in the presence of animals is good for people, that physical contact with animals, such as stroking an animal, uh, can really help to reduce stress levels, uh, and to, especially in the, the aftermath of a traumatic event. Uh, and this has been tested in a variety of settings. I mentioned a couple there, such as psychiatric treatment, children with disabilities. There's even quite a bit of evidence about, about the, the benefit of uh, dogs uh, being partnered with students who are studying for university exams, for example, but all, all sorts of stressful scenarios where people are stressed, being around animals is good for them. It helps to reduce the stress. And then specifically, when we look at the use of specially trained facility dogs with child victims, particularly of child sexual abuse, uh, again, there's, there's quite a bit of emerging evidence. You know, this is a relatively new practice, but the evidence so far is all pointing in one direction, really. We know about the risks of secondary traumatization. I think this, this audience, I don't need to labor that point. Uh, we know that child sex abuse victims uh, often very much struggle to, uh, to tell people about their experiences, to share uh, the, the trauma of what they've gone through. 
they often mistrust adults because of what has already happened to them. Um, and the evidence shows that facility dogs, uh, simply by being in the presence of the child, by providing a different focus for the child, uh, reducing the stress, providing a source of comfort to the child, uh, providing in some ways a distraction from the, the trauma of the experience of, of relating their experience uh, to strangers, um, can really help in, in, in many different ways. They help uh, to reduce the stress levels, to calm the child, to soothe the child. Uh, they also, in, in turn, then help the child to open up the child remains calm, can process the questions that are put to the child um, more uh, carefully, respond then in a more effective way to the questions and provide better evidence uh, that ultimately is, is more likely to secure a successful prosecution of the perpetrator. Um, so those are those sources mentioned there uh, you know, provide quite a range of evidence uh, and consistent evidence about the, the, the variety of impacts. Uh, and indeed, on top of that, there's also evidence about the benefits of the dog, uh, not only for the, the, the child victim, but indeed for uh, the professional people who are interacting with the child victim, be that the, the police, uh, the judge, the court staff, um, and knock on benefits for uh, the child's family as well. <clears throat> So, as I say, that evidence all arose in, in the North American context, by and large. Uh, it arose very much in the context of cases involving children and child sex abuse in particular. Um, so what we did in the FIDO project then was we sought to bring this practice to Europe uh, and to start experimenting with using facility dogs uh, as a means of mitigating trauma for victims uh, in a range of different circumstances outside of uh, the specific context of child sexual abuse. So some of the, the victims that have, FIDO has worked with in the last two years uh, have been uh, victims of child sex abuse, uh, but it has been broader than that. Uh, we have added in victims of other crimes. We've added in uh, witnesses of crimes as well as victims. And in particular, domestic violence has been a, a, a significant part of the work of FIDO. So we've had three pilot programs with three different organizations, one in France with a victim support organization, one in Italy in a domestic violence shelter, and one in Belgium where the dog was placed with, with a, a, a police force um, and, and to, to assist them in their work with victims. Um, and what we did essentially over the last two years was, in addition to partnering the victims with the dogs, we also collected data about the victim's experience of working with the dog um, and put uh, a series of questions to them before and after their interactions with the justice system, be it police interviews or courtroom testimony or so on, um, seeking to measure their levels of stress, their levels of well-being, um, and their their reflections on, on the role that the dog played in, in, in that process. We also simultaneously uh, surveyed both the staff members uh, of the various organizations who were working with the victims, uh, and we surveyed parents or support persons who accompanied the victims um, to these interviews. Now, I don't have time to get through all of the data, but what I'm going to do is uh, in particular focus on a, a sample of the qualitative data. So we collected quantitative data where we measured people's stress levels and well-being levels on a scale. But we also collected qualitative data where people had an opportunity to tell us in their own words uh, how they experienced their interaction with the justice system and how they experienced uh, the dog as a, as, a, as a support measure within all of that. So that's only going to focus on because that in many ways is the data that, that's most powerful, I think. Um, and what we found was that on the whole, uh, I will talk about the exceptions to this in a, a little bit, but overall there was a very uh, strong trend that the vast majority of victims who participated in the project found the presence of the dog very helpful and very reassuring. Um, so we were we asked them before the interview how they felt, we asked them after the interview how they felt, and this is an indicative quote here from a 15-year-old female victim of sexual abuse who was very clear before the interview and in saying that she felt very stressed, she was very anxious and nervous about having to go into this interview and speak about what had happened to her. Um, after the interview, uh, she came out and, and in her own words said that she felt pretty good. I felt at peace. Uh, I felt confident and the dog is there. He allowed me to remain, remain serene. Uh, and that idea of the calming and soothing effect of the dog was a real theme. People talk a lot about the dogs having that effect on them um, and talked a lot about feelings of trust towards the dog uh, and developing a relationship with the dog. Um, so here, for example, we have a 54-year-old female victim of domestic violence. Uh, before her interview, she said, 
Uh, I'm empty sometimes. I feel like a raft lost on the open sea. Uh, and we can contrast uh, that feeling before the interview with what she said after her interview, uh, when she said, the dog helped me to express myself more clearly. His presence allowed me not to be intimidated. I hardly ever looked for my words. My words came by themselves, in fact. I noticed that I cry less when she is present. Similarly, another domestic violence victim here uh, talking about her experience in, in the interview says, yes, the dog helps a lot during the interview. He allows you to pause when the emotion is too much. He helps to soothe painful moments when we recount our experience and what it feels like. So that idea of interviews uh, and courtroom testimony involving people having to confront these extremely difficult, painful memories from their past, um, and that being something which is, is made easier by the presence of this dog with whom they have developed a relationship, developed a, a feelings of affection and trust towards the dog. And that presence of the dog just takes the sting out of some of those, those particularly difficult moments during the process. Uh, here we have a male victim, age 63, he had been a victim of a burglary. Um, and the, the dog, and the, this particular dog's name was Fluff. He says, Fluff came to visit and I love getting to know him. He's nice and good. I used to have dogs too, and it was nice to cuddle and pet a dog because that was a long time ago. Uh, this female 37 year old victim of domestic violence said the dog radiates calm and that comforted me. Uh, and one of the things about these dogs, they are trained essentially to, to really come in and uh, just lie there near the victim. Uh, they are, you, you know, very much that they're not, you know, people would have ideas of dogs and what, what dogs would be doing at any given moment in time. But these dogs are, are, are trained really to just be there and just be whatever the person they needs. Uh, children sometimes will lie back and lie their head on the dog or uh, other people will have the dog next to them, be it on the ground or on a couch next to them uh, and just have their hand on them. But that uh, sort of very steady emotional state that the dog projects really has a very big and, and beneficial impact on the victims. Now, I should say that that it wasn't uh, entirely the case that every single victim talked about th these benefits. Uh, there were uh, a, a minority, a small minority, but a minority nonetheless uh, of victims who uh, reported a positive experience, but attributed that positive experience to the, the professionals they were working with rather than to the dog. Um, so here we have a 21 year old female victim of sexual abuse. And she says, I was happy the dog was there. But as I was already confident, I was very comfortable with the sort of psychologist. Orfe, the dog, uh, didn't necessarily make me feel better. It was great fun to see a dog. I'd rather say it added more. Uh, so here she's saying, look, yes, the dog was good, but really the, the, the main thing that helped me was that I had a very good psychologist and a very good relationship with the psychologist. And that was uh, the focus for this victim rather than the, the, the dog. Um, so that, that was a view that, that came up in some of the data, but as I say, the, the, the clear majority of victims uh, did emphasize uh, the value of the dog. Now, within the domestic violence shelter, and this is, was a very new and novel part of the FIDO project, where we had victims who were living in a domestic violence shelter, uh, often for, for lengthy periods, months or maybe even a year or more. Uh, and were then spending uh, prolonged periods of time with the dog across this, this stay in the shelter. Uh, here we have a 40-year-old a female saying the dog was most helpful. In all kinds of meetings at the shelter, there should be a facility dog. It's of great help for children who are traumatized and need the unconditional love of a dog. Um, so that's another one of those, those comments on that theme of trust and affection. And um, the idea that the dog isn't judging you, the dog simply uh, comes along and, and will we'll, we'll provide that unconditional love that people are craving. A 55-year-old female saying, for me, the presence of the dog is extremely important. It helps me express emotions that I cannot express with people. It gives me solace. I know I can trust him and he can trust me. One of the variations we did notice uh, was that the data was more consistently positive among teenagers and adults compared to young children. The, the views of young children were a little bit more mixed, uh, I think largely because some of them had a, a little bit of anxiety at times around dogs, particularly, you know, if they weren't used to them. Um, so some, some young children were delighted with the dogs, some less so. Here we have a, a seven-year-old male, a sexual abuse victim saying, Fluff is cute, he's, a, he's really calm and a good dog and I immediately felt less rushed thanks to him. So that's a positive experience. Contrast that to a six-year-old female who said, no, I like small dogs, but this one's too big and I'm scared of it. So that was, it was a, a, I guess, a, a lesson to be learned from the project around, uh, you know, the, the, the need to really be 
um, uh, mindful of the fact that not not necessarily every victim is is immediately going to feel comfortable uh, with a dog, and and if you're going to use them, you need to to take that into account. Um, finally, the parents and support persons, their perception of all of this, uh, we see here a mother of a sexual abuse victim um, saying here not only that the dog was beneficial, but in fact, seeing the benefit of the dog made the mother uh, feel better about seeking support for the child through a psychologist. So, so saying by explaining to me, well, what to use the dog for during these sessions, this greatly contributed to the desire to go to the session with the psychologist for my daughter. It calms the situation and the anxiety. I feel comfortable in her presence and I see that it brings joy to my daughter, even if she has to remember the painful facts that she would have felt in her life. So that whole issue of victims coming forward, uh, that in a sense, you know, if you have uh, parents who see children with anxiety about seeking support, be it from a psychologist or other, other uh, therapeutic support, that the presence of the dog and seeing the benefit of the dog might make them uh, quicker to come forward and quicker to engage with those kinds of supports. Um, finally, staff, uh, just uh, the staff very much were, were really positive about how it, it helps them to do their work and helps the victims to open up. Uh, here we have one, one professional saying the dog helped the victim to feel calmer and made her laugh. Orfe drank water for three minutes so he could joke about it. Yes, the victim is very comfortable having Orfe around. And the other quote saying similar things about how the dog helps the victim to relax and help them to link in and, and make that connection uh, with the victim. So the discussion really around that is that for what FIDO has done is it has added to the, what we already know, that we have a lot of very strong international evidence about the benefits of facility dogs for child victims. Uh, FIDO has added new evidence in new contexts, new geographic locations, new uh, settings, including domestic violence shelters, police state, uh, you know, dogs placed with police, um, working with adult victims and so on. And so all of this really, I think, uh, the lesson we are drawing from the, the FIDO project is that, that uh, it, it advances the case to say that where states have these clear obligations under international human rights law um, to try to mitigate secondary trauma for victims of crime, uh, where well, facility dogs are a very effective and very promising way of doing that. Uh, and so really there's, there's a strong case to be made that this should become a standard service available in, in, in criminal justice systems uh, around the world. Um, so I will leave it there. Uh, that's just a quick shot of the, the various uh, dogs from the, the FIDO project. Um, so I'd be delighted to take any questions on the panel later on if people have those. Um, thank you for your attention.